three things you use every day and they're costing you thousands. It's Brian Preston, the money guy. Yeah, Brian, I'm super excited about this show because this is one of the things, I think this is what I like to call sort of an eye-opening show, right? You don't recognize oftentimes how impactful the consumption decisions you make, whether they're small consumption decisions or big consumption decisions, how impactful they can be over the long term. And so we want to kind of unpack that around sort of three common things that folks spend money on every day. Yeah, everybody knows we're Army of Dollar Bills folks, mm-hmm. meaning that we we really focus on the value of every dollar that you get to lead and make decisions on. And we focus a lot uh, because the deliverables, like if you look at the money multiplier mm-hmm. that we have, I think a lot of times since we are wealth managers and we're helping you build wealth, we talk about what each dollar has the potential to become if you invest That's it. That's right. But realize every time a dollar comes into your, your your leadership, you have an incremental decision. Do you spend and consume it mm-hmm. or do you invest it? And we, we focus a lot on the investing, but there's also the opportunity cost of every dollar you consume right. with your life of what it could become. And I think that's something we wanted to kind of pivot and focus on things that every American is spending money on that might be costing them a lot of opportunity in the future. Yeah, and if you're if this is your first time checking in, whether it's your first time interacting, and you've not heard of our wealth multiplier, go to our website, go to moneyguy.com slash resources. You can go, go download this, and it will show you exactly at your age what every dollar can turn into for you by the time you get to 65. So it's super, super powerful, super motivating, especially for young folks. You know, it's the whole $1 to $88 type idea. If you've not downloaded that, go to moneyguide.com slash resources and check that out. Before we go into the deep dive on what each dollar that you're spending or consuming could have become, I do think it's worth doubling back to, because it's the whole reason I'm on this journey, Mm -hmm. is that as a young high school student, I had an economics teacher, y'all have heard me tell this story, where they kind of opened up the world to me by sharing that if I saved $100 Mm -hmm. a month, I could be a millionaire by the time I retired. And I was like, say what? Because you were working at that time. Yeah, I worked at Hardee's, working drive through And I mean, and by the way, minimum wage back then was $3.80. And And even making $3.80 an hour, I was like, I could save a hundred dollars a month. And you know, and we have learned as I've gotten more understanding of how compounding growth works, how investing works. This is completely true, but we want to actually put the numbers on it because my high school economics teacher was actually off. It's actually less than because mm-hmm. I was in, I was 17 years old at the time. It, it's a lot different, and both can go over what it takes to become a millionaire. Yeah. So if you have this goal of becoming a millionaire, how much you need to save to do that very much depends on how old you are. So we have this really easy illustration we do, and we say, let's assume that a 20 year old can earn 10 percent per year, and a 21-year-old can earn 9.9 and then 9.8, 9.7, all the way down. And we said, how much would you have to save on a monthly basis, starting at each of these ages, to get to a million dollars by the time that you turn 65? And you're right. For a 20-year-old, the number is only $95. So Mr. Morrow telling you that you had to save 100 bucks at like 17, he was off, right? Yeah. You don't have to save 100 bucks at 20. You have to do $95. At 25 making a decision to put away just $158 per month can turn you into a millionaire by 65. At 30, the number goes to 270. Mm -hmm. At 40, the number starts to get a little bit higher. Now you've got to save almost $800 a month. If you start at zero uh, at 40 years of age to start building your wealth, at 50, the number goes to $2,500 a month. And then at 60, it becomes really, really difficult. You've got to save $13,000 a month starting at age 60 if you want to be a millionaire by the time that you get to 65. So what you can see is that the earlier you figure this out, the sooner you recognize how powerful your dollars can be, the easier it is to build wealth over the long term. And that's a good setup now to talk about not only the money you're investing, but every incremental decision you make on how you spend your money. And let's start a deep dive into the first section is, Let's talk about what it could be costing you in the long term with your monthly subscriptions and then wasted time. Yep. Now, Bo, this is something that I find very interesting because I I, want to make sure people know we're not contradicting each other. Sure. 
and the fact that there's a lot of discussion in the financial world about the latte effect. Yep. Of you know, if you will s- just quit cut out coffee, and stop quit going, going to, to Starbucks. Starbucks. Yeah, you, you you know, that is going to be that one decision is going to be what puts you on easy street. But I think sometimes when you talk about the latte mm-hmm. effect, what if the one thing that you wake up in the morning and it just brings you so much happiness mm-hmm. is that Starbucks coffee? Are you truly costing yourself your potential becoming a millionaire Mm -hmm. if you really love coffee. That's why we've always said, hey, I want you to do plenty more and often Mm -hmm. of the things that bring you joy, happiness, and fulfillment because that's what gives life the deep meaning and the happiness that we're all striving to reach even with money. But there's a bigger decision you have to make on what happens if you're just wasting? And that's mm-hmm. kind of where we wanted to focus on. Yeah, it's so funny, Brian. And, and I, you've done this. I mean, you know, when when you and I first met, you were in your early 30s. And it was wild. Uh, I used to watch you. Uh, you would, you know, you'd be buying something online. It might be Christmas time or whatever. And you would spend a lot of time going out and trying to find a coupon code or trying to find a way to say, and I'm like, Brian, why are you doing that? Right? You've been successful. You know, why, why are you trying to make sure that you get the absolute best deal possible? And you said to me back then, you said, Bo, I am a field general. Yeah. And every single dollar that I have matters. And so I want to make sure that I'm not being lazy and just letting dollars flow out of my wallet, flow out of my backpack. That's a different thing, just like you said, than someone who just enjoys coffee actually uses their money to purchase something they enjoy. There's a difference in buying lattes because you like it and just being lazy and letting money evacuate. And I feel like when it comes to subscriptions and when it comes to specifically your time, a lot of us kind of fall in this trap of being lazy and just letting it kind of escape from us without really recognizing it. Yeah, so no, for, first homework item is just know what your why is, what brings you happy, happiness, fulfillment. Do as much of that as possible. But by the same token... Don't be spending money and wasting it. Mm-hmm. I mean, there's all kind of, I see it on, on social media. Somebody will show up a picture of a T-shirt, that you know, a designer T-shirt that's 80 bucks mm-hmm. versus, you know, a Hanes T-shirt that's that you like can get for $3. four or five bucks, you know, and probably getting a group of three. And, and if that's not your thing, you know, figure out how you mm-hmm. can maximize, like I said, the things that bring you happiness and fulfillment, but then just don't waste money. And that's the thing where we want to talk about subscriptions mm-hmm. is because I find – a lot of times there's industries that are set up to where they kind of coax you into signing up and then they hope you forget about them and you yep. just on a monthly draw. I, Forever. I, right now, and I should have I brought a prop. I should have played my mini carrot top. I came back from vacation. Sitting in my chair is a subscription to Sports Illustrated. Oh, yeah, yeah, yeah. And I'm like, what the heck is this? Because it, And it's got my name, it's got my address, and I'm like, I didn't sign and up And you're for not this. a big, like, Sports Illustrated aficionado. That's so I have, not, I have not tracked it down to figure out how in the world I have a subscription to Sports Illustrated. But I have a feeling that I have gone on a website or signed up for something that, or bought something mm-hmm. that came with a free subscription because mm-hmm. they're prom in the pump, and you know what happens. If I don't cancel this thing, it's probably it's gonna going, I'm going to start, start getting charging a you. bill to charge. Well, think about all of the streaming services mm-hmm. we all sign up for. You know, in the beginning, it seems like, hey, I'll just pay fifteen ninety nine mm-hmm. a month. What's the harm of that? But yep. the problem is, is that you end up having six or seven different streaming services. This can get very expensive very quickly. Yeah, that's what I was going to say. We found that the average person spends about two hundred and seventy three dollars per month on streaming services, and I thought, man, that that just sounds High, like no, that's it's almost three hundred dollars a month for those types of things, for apps and so forth. There's no way people are actually doing that. And then we actually went and pulled the most popular streaming services, and this is by percentage of households that actually have a, per, a subscription. Uh, number one was Netflix. Yeah. You got, Brian, you have Netflix? Of course, I have All right. Netflix. Number two was Hulu. Brian, you have Hulu? Uh, Bo, I'm not the perfect. No, case but study so here's, on this because I'm already kind of on a path. And but yes, he, I have Hulu. And here's what I think is interesting. Number three is Amazon yes, Prime have, Video. Uh, yeah. Number four is Disney Plus. Of course, I found myself in the same. I'm like, oh no, I don't spend three hundred dollars a month on this stuff. No way does the average person do that. And yet, as we started kind of clicking through, I was like, oh yeah, I've got that one. I've got that one. I've got that one. And if you would have asked me how many I had, I don't know that I would have been able to quantify it very easily because it is one of those things. It's kind of like a patchwork quilt that you just kind of add them on as you go. 
and you lose track of it. You don't realize how they add up over time. This, this is how bad this has gotten. We just put up the top four, but if you think about laying in the background is we have Apple mm-hmm. has their own streaming mm-hmm. service now with a monthly fee. You got HBO Max. Yep. And then it's not even when we look at that $273 a month, it includes your cloud storage apps. Sure. It includes your mill services, your oh, DoorDashes, yeah. yep. you know, the Ubers and those type of things. Your Wi-Fi and your mobile service. Mm-hmm. And, and it, this is why... I want to tell you this is right for you to pay attention to because I bet a lot of you now, Bo. I watch a lot of TV. Right. You don't. I you don't. You probably and could save money. I absolutely. If could. you if you looked at this based upon your current behavior, I also think I've noticed I have a family plan for my cell phone provider. Things have changed so much with cell phone services. Mm-hmm. And that's included in that $273. I know there's savings if you guys will just spend a little time figuring out who's your ungrateful service provider, like your mobile service, making sure you're getting the best deal. Because a lot of them are giving you data now. A lot of them are no longer restricting, mm-hmm. and they're going to flat pricing of like 40 bucks a month yep. if you're doing a family plan. Pay attention to these things because there's probably some opportunity for you to save money. And what I think is interesting is it's not just the cost, right? So obviously all of these services have a cost. There's an outflow, a monthly subscription service that you have to pay, but they also take your most valuable resource, if we're going to be honest, and that is your time. The average person spends four hours per day watching streaming services. Streaming services, And what, this I thought was wild. Uh, during the pandemic, that number actually rose to eight hours per day of streaming services. That's a lot. I mean, if you, think, you know, if you think about sleeping eight hours a day and you're spending of your waking hours either four to eight hours a day, you are spending a lot of time in front of these types of services, these types of providers. So this is what I have found as I'm getting older. Mm -hmm. Life is unfair in so many ways. And the fact that when you're young, like when I was in my 20s and 30s, well, 20s, pre-children, you think you're busy until you have your children. Mm -hmm. And then you're like, holy cow, where did my time go? And then the other thing is, is you fast forward as you get promoted at work, you now have the you have children. Mm-hmm. You're like, I don't have time to do any. So you're Nothing. making more money. You're making all the money that you want to at that point, but you have zero time yep. because just life gets very busy. So I want to encourage, and this is something we're going to focus on because I recognize why do people want financial independence is so you can do life on your terms. Mm-hmm. You control time. But the unfairness to life is a lot of times in your 20s, you have an abundance of time, but very limited resources of wealth. We're telling you to turn this thing upside down. Mm-hmm. If you could take an incremental, just a little bit of your time in your 20s when it's extra, you have mm-hmm. plenty of it, you have excess that you're wasting it on social media, video games, and other things. What if you took a small window of time, like five years, and you said, I'm going to focus this five years on maybe I go work during this excess capacity. I'm going to trim down these subscriptions. Mm -hmm. What would that look like? Yeah, and so we actually wanted to put some numbers to it. Let's kind of walk through an exercise of a case study of just Mm -hmm. how impactful that this could be. So let's say that you cut your subscriptions by 50%. Let's say you're the average person spending that $270 a month, and you cut it by 50%. That means you'd have an extra $136 per month back in your back pocket. And then let's say that with your new free time, because you've cut out some of those subscriptions, you pick up a side hustle earning $150 a week. And we actually did a great show a couple months ago talking about side hustles on how right now is a great time to go figure out how to make additional dollars if you have additional time. And let's say that you can make about $150 per week. After taxes, because if you have a side hustle and you have hustle income coming in, you got to pay tax on it you would have an extra $616 coming in every month, right? So not only the time that you're using to go create income, but also the savings you have from cutting subscriptions, you'd have over $600 a month extra. Well, what if you save that just for five years? You said this is just like a five-year thing. If you just take 616 and multiply it times the 60 months, you would have saved $36,960. I think a lot of people are going to watch this and go, ooh. I don't know if I could trim it down. Mm -hmm. And they're going to say, did you guys fact check to see if this is even possible? So here's what we did. 
we should actually ask the content team to see what people are spending on subscriptions. Mm -hmm. And this also gives me a great opportunity to, to plug. If you guys aren't checking out FYI by FTE, yep. Daniel is actually spending less than a hundred dollars a month on all these things that we're talking about. So it is possible to do this. We fact-checked it to make sure that we didn't want to throw out something that was mm -hmm. unrealistic. And we found out. And then Nate the Great is right behind this. Yep. I think he came in right at $140 a month. So yep. this is completely possible if you really prioritize this decision-making. Yeah, absolutely. All right, so we know that with that $600, you'd have saved almost $37,000 over that five years. Well, what if... You didn't just save it. You decided to put it to work for you because you understand how powerful your army of dollar bills can be. So you saved it and you invested it every month. And let's assume that you could just make on average 8%. Well, after five years, you would have turned that into $45,000, right? So all you did was you picked up a little side gig working a few hours a week and you cut your subscriptions. And all of a sudden, after five years, you had $45,000 saved. But wait, there's more because we know that financial mutants wouldn't say, okay, well, great. I got this 45,000. I'm going to go spend that. What if you decided I'm never going to save another dime and I'm just going to let that $45,000 continue to grow until I get to retirement? After 30 years, those two very small decisions you made could be worth $495,000, almost half a million bucks just from cutting monthly costs and making an extra $150 a week. Yeah, and we, and we used an assumption of 8%. Yep. You know, if this is somebody who did this in their 20s. That number, we very easily could have boosted this return to 9%, even 9.5% yep. if somebody started this when they were in their 20s. But here's the thing I want you guys to know. We tried to be realistic with the fact that we said, we're only going to make people be this restrictive for five years because I want you to feel like you're rewarding, that you're working towards a goal. And remember, these are not the things that are taking away your happiness or your joy. This is just focusing on not wasting, That's looking right. at your life to figure out where are there dollars that are falling aside that aren't where they should be, and where is your time being focused for a short period of time, and is that incrementally, that one small decision going to have a tremendous impact later, why not see if you can optimize all of these decisions in your life? Because a financial mutant has to have a different mindset. You have to kind of view the world differently. I know I have a lot of friends and they'll sign up and say, oh, it's only 10 bucks a month. Yeah. It's only 12 bucks a month. We want you to start thinking, well, it's not just 10 bucks a month, 12 bucks a month. Those are future soldiers in my army dollar bill that are not going to work. So if I don't need it or would derive utility from it or really highly want it, then maybe I should cut it out and get those dollars working. You, you just said something that was very powerful. Financial mutants have to process the world differently. Mm -hmm. There are entire industries that are built upon, and we're going to cover some of this, how you can afford everything at 150 to 200 bucks at a time, meaning yep. that if you want a, a new car, no problem. We'll just finance it out for seven, eight years. It's $200 a month. If you want a jet ski that you can pull behind your car, we can get you that for 150 yep. bucks a month. If you want to get into, it doesn't matter what you want. If you want an RV or a camper because now you can work from anywhere, we'll get you that for 220 bucks a month. All these things are possible. I'm telling you, instead of falling into that consumerism, because the whole consumer economy that we live in America is built upon this, look at it the exact opposite way and say, how can I at 150 bucks to 200 bucks a month change where I'm going and what I'm creating for the long term? You can revolutionize and you can create everything you want, which is freedom, it's time, it's spending your money, it's spending your time how you want if you'll think and change your mindset that one little step. All right. So obviously there are these uh, smaller, I'm going to call them a smaller decisions. They're actually big decisions in terms of their impact, but like subscriptions and what we're doing with our extra time. But we also use things every day that are big decisions, big life decisions. That kind of takes us to our second point of something, a decision you're making that could be costing you thousands, if not tens of thousands, if not hundreds of thousands of dollars. And that's how you make your decision around housing. And housing is so unique right now. Mm -hmm. I mean, I got to tell you, I mean, we spent a lot of the content team 
time when they say you say it's a distraction or Brian has taken us on all these tangents. Shots fired. It's really, but I do talk about because we have the content team is divided. We have some of us that own houses, yep. and then we have some that are, you know, aspir- mm-hmm. aspirationally Pre-home wanting to owners. own housing, and and that's the problem is that the the. The decision is a hard one to make, mm-hmm. but and it is the biggest thing because shelter. What happens when it rains outside? Where do you sleep at night? All these things are mm-hmm. impacted. We got to have a place to lay our head at night. Housing is tremendous, and it's evolving quickly. So we have done this in the past, but guys, guess what? The numbers are changing it's so quickly we wanted to update it. I can't wait to see what the 2021 numbers mm-hmm. look like, but we said, what if – you could focus on your incremental decision making on where you lay your head at night and in, use that savings to invest in the future. Yeah, I think what's really interesting, we asked Daniel to go pull some stats uh, and we wanted him to update the statistics that we looked at last year to say, okay, how has this changed? What has changed? And so when we asked the question, how much do Americans spend on homes? It's interesting. We know that the average median household here in this country is about $67,500. That's sort of the median household income right now, according to, according to the Federal Reserve economic data. We also know that the median price of a new home right now is about $391,000. So doing some very simple math that we can say on the median, not the, on the median, the median new home is about 5.8 times the median income. So you could say that people are spending roughly 5.8 to 6 times their annual income on housing. I would argue, Brian, that's probably a little bit further above, a little bit higher than the general rule of thumb that we recommend. Oh, yeah. But it's understandable in some degrees in the fact that if you think about this time last year when we did mm-hmm. this, now it was, it was a little over a year. Sure. But the last time we provided a case study on this, that median price of a new home here in the United States was three hundred and seventeen thousand dollars. So in in one year, it went from three seventeen to three ninety. But we know the true run up, the inflation that we're all feeling right now, has really happened in twenty twenty one. I have no doubt when we update this in twenty twenty one. I mean, in twenty twenty two. This number is going to be well into the 400s. So it, it, the, as these numbers get bigger, you need to pay more and mm-hmm. more attention to what multiple of your income you're spending. The old case study, or the old benchmark that we used to tell people was try to keep your spending at three times right. your gross income. We know these are unique times. Mm-hmm. For this case study, we boosted it up to four times. Realize the median right now is 5.8 times your income, we said, what if it was four times, what would that do? Now, before we share the numbers and the case study, I can already hear, because Brian, we, the comments will already start coming in where somebody says, uh, Brian, I'm, I'm not going to listen anymore. You say $390,000. I live on one of the coasts, or I live in a major city, or I live in an up and coming, and there's no way we can buy a house here for $390,000. I agree. I agree. What we're going to share, and when it comes to financial decision making, a lot of the decisions we make are on the margin. So even though the numbers, the absolute numbers might not be the same, I want you to watch how this case study evolves. And Brian, you'll probably share how it's applicable no matter what part of the country or where your cost of living is. Yeah, because this is the great thing about math. The same points we're about to make, we'll show you how simple this decision is, even for people who live in high cost of living areas. So we said, okay, let's look at two folks. Uh, Let's look at the person that buys the expensive home, which we just determined, you know, was 5.8 times median income of about $391,000 versus someone who bought, quote unquote, an affordable home, which would be $270,000. And that's just the median household income times four, right? So 390 versus 270. Well, when you buy the home, assuming you're going to put 20% down, The person buying the expensive home is going to have a mortgage of about $313,000. The person buying the affordable home is going to have a mortgage of about $216,000. When you break that down on a 30-year mortgage, and we assumed a 3.5% mortgage rate, the monthly payment, not looking at taxes or insurance, just principal and interest, for the expensive home is about $1,400 a month. And for the affordable home is about $970 a month. That's a difference of about $434 per month. So let's bring this into reality for those that live in the high cost of living areas. Hopefully they didn't tap out when they saw these prices because I know a lot of them, their tongues fell out of their mouth and they go, I'd love to buy a house. 
for I don't care if it's two seventy or three ninety one. We understand. We live in mm-hmm. in the Nashville area. We have experienced what it's like when everybody from California and Chicago moves to your community where everything feels like a nickel yep. to them. That cost of living where now you get to it's four hundred and fifty to five hundred dollars a square foot mm-hmm. in certain parts of the community. We know what it's like to live in a high cost of living area, but here's the point I want to make to you. Look at the actual mortgage, because that's really what we're talking about. Since we've based this entire incremental decision on the principal and interest of your monthly payment, you can see there's only a $96,000 difference between those two numbers. So we can round that up to a $100,000 decision on your housing purchase is about $434 a month of incremental decision-making where you can do the opportunity cost. So if you think about it, if you live in California, if you live in Nashville, if you live in New York, maybe your number is not 312 versus 216. Maybe your number is 500,000 versus 600,000 mm-hmm. or 500,000 versus 700,000. It doesn't matter. You could do an increment of $100,000 and know every $100,000 you can save on your decision will allow you to invest Instead of spend and consume $434 a month, there is something there. Because, by the way, because I know a lot of you are also going to say, counterpoint is the more expensive houses go appreciate. Yes, we'll get that. But realize we're leaving a lot on the table by saying the bigger home is also going to cost more in taxes, yep. more in insurance. It's going to cost more to furnish. And, and, and there's a lot of things mm-hmm. that go with the bigger home. I think the appreciation versus the additional expenses probably offset itself to enough to where this is a true, what can I do if I actually invest that money versus just locking it into this housing decision? Yeah, that's the so what. Okay, for every $100,000 mortgage decision I make, if it saves me $434 a month, why does that matter? Well, what if you took that four thirty four dollars and you decided I'm going to save that every month over the course of the entire 30 years while I'm paying off the mortgage. And let's say that we can earn 8% on average while we're investing those dollars. Well, after 30 years, you would have saved a total of $156,674. That's just the 434 times the number of months. However, when it grows and you allow compounding interest to do what compounding interest does, and let's say you were a 30-year-old and you were going to retire at 65 that monthly $434 of savings could turn into $977,000, almost a million dollars. I'll say it a little bit differently. If you have a 35-year time horizon for money, right? Every $100,000 you decide to take on as a mortgage could be a million dollars in retirement assets, a million dollars in future soldiers in your army of dollar bills. Yeah, so I mean, that's, that is the true takeaway. 100000 almost a million out of your future selves opportunity cost. So if you're doing 200000 almost $2 million, mm-hmm. you can see how this builds up very rapidly. Think about these things. It's not only the little dollars you spend, it's the big dollars, including housing, that can truly impact your long-term financial independence. Okay, Brian. So we've talked about uh, the smaller decisions, subscriptions and how we use our time. We've talked about the bigger decisions. The biggest decision most people often make in their life is like the housing decision, what house they're going to live in. Let's talk about something kind of in the middle. And I feel like in the world that you and I live in, this is probably the area where we see people screw it up the most and get the most caught up with keeping up with the Joneses and uh uh-oh, and I made a bad decision. It's going to have a long tail and that is your car, your automobile purchases. Well, we live in a unique time. With social media and doing it for the gram, I mean, everybody, if you're going to flex, because nobody comes home at, with you at night usually. They mm-hmm. see you at the stoplight. They That's see right. you what the you park station. in the, at your workplace. They see what car you park. So especially when you're young and also when you're in your 20s, you can't afford to go buy a big house That's anyway. Right. So, But the thing that, and because the industries are set up to where it doesn't really matter what you make, the auto industry will let you buy about anything because what they've t- found is a solution. If you don't have the income, that's all right. We'll just make sure we get the payments down mm-hmm. as low as possible by expanding out how long you have to pay for this vehicle. And then it's also, you think about all the influence that we're always surrounded by. And this is what makes us feel so simple or so so small 
is that, and I love this. I mean, if you go on TikTok, there's a guy who's super successful Mm -hmm. that he goes up to people driving exotic cars and says, hey, what do you do for a living? I love this stuff. And, And there's nothing wrong with this content. But it is one of those things where I think in addition to this, I know there's other people that I, I follow on Twitter who have gotten caught up in, and I'm not even going to say names, but they're driving around in Lambos, yep. they're doing all kinds of things, and you're like, wow, all I have to do is follow this person, and I too will have this lifestyle. But it's worth noting, what are these decisions actually costing you in the long term? But before we got into the deep dive of the numbers, we said, hey, Let's play into this because this is the content we pulled from TikTok and we actually pulled up some of the cars. We got a McLaren, we got a Ford GT, and we got a, a G-Wagon, a G-Wagon yep. which we, those cars are around here where we live too. I don't understand it. I don't understand when I see that car costs $160,000, it's a box. And I guess it's because that, that emblem, they get bigger. You know, the bigger, the bigger the emblem, the more you're willing to pay, I guess. So here's what I thought was interesting. And I don't know if you put this together. Uh, when the content team was going and finding these TikToks, they actually picked young folks, right? Did you notice that all three yeah. drivers all of these, these drivers are, young? are young drivers? So the question you naturally have, and we all have this, right, is you see a young person driving a McLaren GT, and you know that that car, you pull up your phone, you see that car costs $230,000. Your natural question is going to be, oh, okay, well, hey, what do you do for a living? And that's exactly what this guy does. He asks people who drive nice cars, hey, what do you do for a living? Well, so that you guys know, so you're not on the edge of your seat, the McLaren GT young guy said, I'm a chef and I make cooking videos online. <laughs> I think that's awesome. He's a content creator and apparently uh, he's done really well. Uh, the Ford GT, the, this uh, is a car that costs $800,000. They said, hey, I love your car. What do you do for a living? He says, um, YouTube videos. Daniel looked him up. He had I like think, seven or eight million subscribers. I think we're in the right spot, right? YouTube, it sounds like, <laughs> sounds like being on YouTube is what leads to this. And then there was the last guy, the G-Wagon, who you said, I don't understand why anyone would drive this. So the question... Well, by the way, this is... So his dad... Uh, oh, well, go ahead. Go ahead. I'm, I'm, ruining, I'm ruining the whole reveal. So the question is, is, okay, what's this young person who Brian would say is making a poor decision buying this G-Wagon? What does he do for a living? He says, I don't do anything. Uh, I'm a student. My dad got it for himself. He didn't like it, so he just gave it to me. <laughs> I mean, but this is the some some successful. His father, as he as he says, mm-hmm. bought this thing because they thought this is going to make me feel cool. This is going to let everybody see. And then he got in his thing. And goes this thing's a tin can, <laughs> and gave it to his son, who obviously, I mean. $160,000 vehicle for it's just crazy. But but that I digress because Bo said the, th- the right thing. Young people are driving in every one of these clips. I think a lot of people in the world would be shocked to find out all these exotic cars that we all glamorize because we see the highlight reel, we see people on Instagram, we see people on TikTok, young, you know, at the top of their their game in in, in youth, but also now wealth. Mm-hmm. Those two don't typically go together. We're like, let's throw some cold water on the reality of the situation. Do most people realize? The exotic car owners or sports car owners are actually old people. It's old It's old people. I mean, because that's, that's the thing that I had Daniel pull this up. And I think, because this is one of the things I, and look, I'm going to make myself sound like I'm, I'm a redneck. Like a you're bit. from where you're from. That's I'm what you make yourself sound like. When I was 17 years old, I had this dream that I knew. I was already a financial mutant in the fact that I knew by the time I turned 25, my insurance rates would go down. And I was like, on my 25th birthday, I'm going to go buy a Corvette. Of course, because that's what every 25-year-old ought to do. You know, because that's what, if you grew up on South Atlanta, you're like, Corvette, that's where it's at. <laughs> and by the way, they are. I mean, if you pull up now a Corvette, they have redesigned mm-hmm. them. They do look more they look exotic good. car-esque. Yep. But you know what the median age, or the average age for an exotic, well, a Corvette, not that it's super exotic, 61 years of age. It's not the 25-year-old. It's not the Brian Preston. It's not the YouTubers. The average Corvette purchaser is a 61-year-old. So that's that's a that's a domestic. That's mm-hmm. an American car. Let's go the next one. You know, because you see, if we go outside of Georgia and in, in, in the southeast, Porsche. Oh yeah, it's a great. You one. know, people want the Porsche. That's 50. Yep. So if you want the 911, you're, you're gonna be 50 years. It's, of again, age. it's not a 25-year-old. It's not a 30-year-old. It's someone who's probably. On the back end of their career, not on the front end of their career. A Ferrari? Because that's, you know, that's tippity top of the food chain. You really are flexing and showing off what you got. It's 51. 
It's very rare you see young people. So I want everybody who's out there, when you're making this opportunity cost decision, this incremental decision of what to do with your next dollar, the reality is most people are not buying super fancy mm -hmm. exotic cars until they're old and probably even have trouble mm -hmm. getting into these vehicles. So don't put that unneeded pressure on yourself. And we decided once again, money guy fashion, mm -hmm. Let's do a case study of something very practical like a Honda Accord yep. versus like a BMW. Because that's what I feel. I don't see a lot of young people buy. I mean, obviously not buying Porsches and Ferraris. I will say I have a bunch of friends. As soon as they got their degree, first thing they did was go out and buy a BMW, a 3 Series or what. Because they got their first job. They signed their first you know, agree, you know, employment agreement, and they thought, I've made it. I went from having 20 bucks in college to now I'm making... $40,000 a year, I'm going to go get myself a super fancy car so that I can look the part. I, by the way, I did try to convince the content team we had to throw a Tesla version in here. It's not Apple's I apples. got outvoted. It's not Apple's So apples. just in case, I just want to keep everybody at bay, I got outvoted. We'll go back to the Honda Accord and BMW case study. So let's look at this, right? If we look at a Honda Accord Sport, because again, we want to compare apples to apples, so we'll look at kind of the sportier version versus the BMW 3 Series uh, 330i. If you look at the cost of ownership for the first five years, looking at maintenance, repairs, and fuel, with the Honda Accord, you'll spend about $10,800 versus on the BMW 3 Series in the first five years of ownership, you'll spend about $17,700. So if you look at the cost of the car plus the amount of the maintenance and repairs and fuel costs, in the first five years, a Honda Accord will cost you about $31,000 less resale value over the first five years. A BMW 3 Series will cost you about $58,000. So that's a difference of about $27,000 yep. in those two consumption decisions. What we think is remarkable is that after 30 years, if you were just to take that $27,000, instead of buying the BMW, instead you decide, I'm going to go with the Accord, I'm going to invest that difference. And I'm going to let that, those uh, soldiers go into my army of dollar bills, and I'm going to let them grow at 8% for the next 30 years. That car decision that you made, for the car that you will not be driving 30 years from now, most likely, that $27,000 decision could have cost you almost $300 thousand dollars in future retirement assets. I talk about it all the time, the hedonic treadmill and how just human nature is we absorb whatever we have so quickly, meaning that the the high you get from purchasing stuff is short lived. Mm -hmm. That dopamine hit where you're you're so happy the new car smell from the chemicals is mm -hmm. there is they're peeling off of the car and you're absorbing them in, thinking how awesome it is. It's short-lived. That's right. So if you're driving the Honda Accord versus the BMW 3 Series, that dopamine hit that makes you feel so good and flexing so strong potentially could be costing you close to $300,000 at retirement. I want you to think about those things as you're going through life. And it's also, there has been something very enjoyable to me as I've made incremental decisions in my life, especially like with cars. Mm -hmm. I grew up, with a, my first car was junky. I mean, it was a straight up junky. The so, Cavalier. Yeah, the, yeah. the, the Ragalier, <laughs> as it was affectionately known. I mean, this thing was, um, as my wife described it, when, when, well, the friend, I was set up on a, a, on a date with my wife, our first date, and she asked Ashley, the girl who'd set us up, she goes, What color is his car? She said, Rust. <laughs> because it didn't, uh, the paint I don't had think kind it was of, supposed to be it's rust. It's not colored. supposed to be a rust colored. I mean, it was a black car, but it, there's just a lot of rust on it and other things. But it is one of those things where every time I've had a life decision, where because I went from the Cavalier to a used Mazda 626, mm -hmm. I thought that car was awesome. Yep. Because I'd incrementally gone up. Then from there, we went. I went to like a Ford Explorer, mm -hmm. and then we went to the Acura. And then, you know, and then I went to the Lexus ES, mm -hmm. which was the bottom entry level, but it was it was new it was and so luxury nice to, to me. Yep. And that's what I'm telling you. If you can set your life up, and that's why I talk about the hedonic treadmill, guys, set some increments mm -hmm. in there. Because that 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 son that we showed on a previous slide that was driving the G Wagon Where's he in his twenties from there. Where do you go? You, and that, and I thought awful. about this as my daughter hit 16. I had this decision when she and she she I was like do I do the Dave Ramsey method where I make her pay half the car 
and you know, so that, and get her a junker, mm-hmm. you know, like every or do I because of safety and all the stuff, the features they put on cars now. Do I go buy her a new one? I could afford to buy her a new sure, one. Sure, yeah. I did the the life decision of letting her pay for half because I did want I didn't want to steal that fulfillment mm-hmm. from her getting a nice car instantly yep. at a young age. I wanted to start going through those life decisions. Guys, there's a lot of things that you have to be careful how fast you bring yourself up to the tippity top tier because you might find not only is this costing you financially, but it's costing you some of the happiness of creating a journey for yourself where you enjoy each phase of your your success versus jumping right off on step one into the luxury, super nice, mm-hmm. and then you're going to find you absorb that just as quickly as you would have the Honda Accord, mm-hmm. and then where do you go from there? And I think that is part of the human conditions problem with money is we're always trying to fill the hole with happiness from the things we buy. And I can tell you from somebody sitting at the top of the food chain, it doesn't fill the right. hole. You better figure out your why because this stuff will have an impact. And Brian, you you say this all the time. Uh, you've said it over and over again. You think of like cars as sort of, financial napalm to your wealth building journey. And one of the reasons is we talked about this. We want to be field generals for our assets and we want to deploy our dollars as effectively and efficiently as possible. One of the big problems with cars, a lot of people, you know, like when, when you're doing a net worth statement, you might like list it in your asset column. The problem with an automobile in your asset column is that it is an asset that loses value rapidly. You've seen this chart from Daniel before. This is data from Edmonds. If you look at how quickly a car depreciates on average, after the first year, it's worth about 81% of its initial value. After year two, it drops to 69% and then 58%, 49%, 40%, 33%. So instead of taking your army of dollar bills and putting it in a Roth IRA, in your 401k, in your 457, and allowing that dollar to become more and more and more valuable, you sink it into an automobile that all you're really guaranteeing is that next year, it will be worth less and then less and then less and less. So if you are someone in normal times out there thinking about making a car decision, obviously there are times when it makes sense to buy new cars. We've talked about that. But if you are looking to get the best bang for your buck, there's nothing wrong with a car that is a few years old where someone else has paid that front end depreciation in normal times. Yeah, and we, and we know these are unique times, but even if you understand that cars, because of inflation, are not depreciating like they historically have, they, they'll they get back to they it. Will. They will. Realize vehicles still, th- that's just one of the downsides of vehicles. In addition to that, you have to pay for the fuel that you're putting into mm-hmm. it. You have to pay for the insurance and it's just something that no matter how nice it is, I mean, if you ever want to entertain yourself, I go to the annual SEMA show out mm-hmm. in Las Vegas. Go on eBay and type in prior SEMA cars, and you can go find on eBay cars that were 15, 12, even 20 years ago, tippity top, and people were just had slobber coming out of their mouth looking at these cars. Now you can go buy these things for, for practically nothing because. They're old. I mean, and that's the thing. All things that you buy, they get old. I mean, so that's the thing is that don't figure out your why so that you don't get caught up in the material stuff that's just going to get old, outdated, and you're going to be disappointed in it in the future. And so here's here's what I think is so, so powerful. So, Brian, you know, like in uh, in baseball, right, There used, you have like specialists. You got like your pitchers or your – you know, growing up, there were like these utility players, right? The folks that could do a lot of different stuff and they could do it really, really well. I think when it comes to building financial independence and being a true financial mutant, you don't just want to get the decision right on your house or just get the decision right on your car or just get the decision right, right on how you spend your time or how you waste your dollars. Because what's amazing is if you can process the world differently and you can view things differently, These seemingly small, isolated decisions can have a huge overall impact in your wealth building journey. Because if we just look at sort of the three that we went through, we said that the decision you make around subscriptions by the time you get to retirement could impact almost $500,000 of your retirement dollars. The housing decision for every $100,000 of mortgage you decide to take on, that could be a million dollars of retirement assets. And then when you make your automobile purchasing decisions, just on one automobile purchase, 
that could cost you almost $300,000 in retirement dollars. And you sort of stack those decisions on top. Just those three things could lead to $2 million of assets by the time that you get to retirement. I think what I love about this is that I get the reflective part of looking over the decades of my working career. And I look at all my friends and I look at other people you hang out with in the community. And I think of people, they're shocked when you're, you get to a point that your financial, your ability to be a financial mutant is no longer undercover Mm -hmm. because there does come a point with success. You just can't hide. That's right. That's kind of how things are going, but you can't, I mean, good financial mutants, likely there's a reason we have the millionaire next door Everyday millionaires. Mm-hmm. Is there's we t- put titles on things like this, minority mindset, and those yep. type of things. Is and we use the word financial mutants. Is because nobody knows who you are, or how you're doing it, because you look like everyone else. But your your friends and your peers, they will look at you and go, "How did so and so get so much more money than me?" I I think we came out of college at the same time. Mm-hmm. We were all making about the same amount of money. How do they, they they look like, to be able to buy that, they have to have millions Mm -hmm. in the bank behind them. How did they do that? It is exactly the list that we just went over and the the life decisions that creates that. Nobody sees this stuff overnight. The the car you drive, you know, the furniture you put in your house, the subscriptions Mm -hmm. you have, how you use your time, the housing you live in, but it will. These incremental decision-making processes, if you do this right, People are going to look at you in the future and be like, how do they do it? And that's what you want. You're not trying to look rich. You're actually trying to become rich. That's exactly right. And I think that's the problem that so much of the world gets caught up in. They're trying to look the part Mm -hmm. versus build the actual reality. And that is, and I can tell you, that is fulfillment, is when people, not because you're you're a flexor or a show-off, but it's just because people are like, Wow, something's different something, about he's the something way they're living their life. We just gave you the clues. Now I would ask you, turn this inward to yourself, because mm-hmm. maybe it's not the cars. Or maybe if you live in a high cost of living area, yes, you can trim $50,000 out of your decision, but it's not the full hundred. You have to find the incremental decision, mm-hmm. the excess in your life to create this success. And I want to challenge you, go be a financial mutant, go live the life that people don't see, but one day they go, how did they do that? You can be a part of that, just become a financial mutant. We create so much with the Money Guy Show, we're hoping we get you inspired and energized to go do this for yourself too. And look, we're going to keep doing it. Our charge here is we want to make sure that we can add as much value to your financial lives as possible so that as you do have a question around Uh, What kind of car should I buy? What kind of house should I buy? How should I approach open enrollment? You feel like you have a team here at the Money Guy Show that can help you navigate that. If you've not gone out to the website, go check out our website, moneyguy.com. We have a resource page out there that is full of free resources like our wealth multiplier, like the Foo Course Cheat Sheet, like how do I know when it makes sense to refinance. If you have a financial question, there's a really good chance that we have a deliverable on our resource page that can help you navigate that decision. If you've not checked out FYI by FTE, it's a brand new blog that Daniel is writing right now. Amazing content going out on that. We want to keep you guys loaded up so that you can keep taking your finances to the next level. Yeah, and I, that's why we have courses, you know, where we're, we're trying to load you up with the financial order of operations mm-hmm. so you know what to do with your next dollar. In addition to that, we have the abundance cycle where you – you know, once you reach a level of success from watching the Money Guy content, you can become a client. And guys, look, we're trying to fill the void even between yep, those two. I, I've, I've seen some of the comments out there where, you know, people are disappointed. They reach out. They want to work with mm-hmm. us, but they're not quite ready. We hear you. We're going to get you something, too, because exactly we don't right. No one should be left behind in this process. Just bear with us. But we are so thankful that so many of you have been part of this journey. You've actually been success stories of the abundance cycle where you are hiring us to become your financial advisors. We'll never be able to say thank you enough. And we're going to create even more content, more items that are going to help you accelerate that journey to make the abundance cycle happen that much sooner for everyone out there. Thank you so much. I'm your host, Brian Preston, Mr. Bo Hansen, Money Guy Team, out. <laughs>